I know what it's like to be a die-hard fan of a movie franchise. And I don't mean just being a fan that watched all movies in the franchise a lot and knows in which year each of these films were released. I'm talking knowing which director and composer worked on each film, knowing about all kinds of minute behind the scenes details, being part of the community behind the franchise. For me, obviously that franchise is the James Bond 007 franchise, a passion driving the core of my YouTube channel. And most other movie franchises I just know on a normal people level. Like for instance, the Star Wars movies. I know fans of these films are really, really passionate about it and me knowing what that's like, I can only respect that. But I personally only know about the Star Wars movies on a very shallow level. I know George Lucas is behind these movies, I know the original trilogy was released first with 1977 Star Wars which was later turned into Episode 4 A New Hope. I know this also partially inspired the Bond producers to cash in on its success and that made Moonraker the space adventure it turned into. I know the prequels were released later and we eventually got the Disney sequels in recent years. And I know that there are a few anthology movies as well, as well as a ton of other Star Wars related series and TV series and other movies. Now I've only seen a couple of these movies somewhere in 2015, by the time The Force Awakens was released and was introduced to them by a friend who's a fan of the films. Unfortunately. I saw the first seven films in episodic order for the first time, which I don't recommend. I know Star Wars fans debate what is the best order to watch these films in. Now I don't want to get too deeply into the order, but going in episodic order just doesn't work for a first time viewer. It's kind of like if the Harry Potter franchise had a prequel trilogy of how Tom Riddle became Lord Voldemort and you are introduced to the wizarding world in that way without even knowing who Harry Potter is and what Hogwarts is. Also, by going in episodic order, one of the greatest movie twists in cinema history is kind of ruined for you. He told me you killed him. No. I am your father. No! No! If of course you weren't already aware of this twist, I mean I know I was without ever having seen any of the films, it's just such a heavily referenced moment engraved into movie culture. Surrender Buzz Lightyear, I have won. I'll never give in, you killed my father. No Buzz, I am your father. No! But also I found going in episodic order for a first time viewer, you are first introduced to Star Wars in a story about taxes and diplomacy and you can really tell the filmmakers assume you know who Anakin is and have some knowledge on the galaxy. So my first time experience was a lot around the lines of, huh. So what are the Jedi? Oh, they have to protect a Republic? So, so why is there a queen if they need to protect a Republic? You know, etc. I didn't get it at all. So watching in public release to me is the better order. This is how audiences originally were introduced to these films. That order also has some problems though. If you watch them in this way, when you get to the end of episode 3 and how Darth Vader is now being set up as the new villain and then you immediately do a time skip of a couple of decades to The Force Awakens. Again, it's like watching how Voldemort was born and then one movie later you watch Harry's kids adventures on Hogwarts. If, you know, if that stuff existed. So I came across what Star Wars fans call the Machete Order. And this video is not made to convince you in which order you should watch these movies in. But for me, this order fixed both problems of the episodic and release orders. Basically, this order keeps most plot twists intact by watching the first two, meaning episode 4 and 5 first. 
That way you are introduced to the Star Wars universe easily and you can still get the big plot twist. Then you do a major flashback by watching the prequel movies to see how Anakin became Darth Vader. They say the Phantom Menace can be skipped but we watch that anyway just for the sake of inclusion. After episode 3, now knowing about Vader's background, then you do the skip back to the finale of the original trilogy, episode 6. And from there, it's more natural to move on to the sequel movies. Again, not trying to convince anyone how to watch these movies, I just randomly decided recently, hey, I can watch the Star Wars movies. I've only seen the first 7, years ago, I never saw episode 8 and 9, why not watch these films with my girlfriend who never saw any of these films to begin with? And the Machete Order appealed to me. Now like I said before, I only know Star Wars on quite a shallow level. So instead of making separate extensive reviews on each of them, I decided to share my thoughts as a Star Wars newbie on what I thought of each of these films. In the Skywalker Saga that is, in Machete Order. So here we go. Kicking it off with the original Star Wars, or as it's known today, Episode 4, A New Hope. And it all starts a long, long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. It's very easy to realize with these movies that the opening crawl is as iconic, meaningful and important to Star Wars fans as the gun barrel is to us Bond fans. This is what opens a Star Wars movie. Maybe Star Wars fans can relate to us why we were so upset that Quantum of Solace and Skyfall didn't open with a gun barrel. But anyway, I digress. The original Star Wars holds up as a classic, introducing you to the Star Wars universe in a very easy to digest way. Sure, there are strange droids and creatures and the technology is very strange but this is what pulls you in because for whatever reason it feels believable and real within the boundaries of this world. The world of Star Wars is immersive and I think any first time viewer of this franchise should start with the original. This film probably has the best opening out of all the Star Wars movies with the introduction to the iconic villain Darth Vader invading the rebel ship and taking Princess Leia hostage. The story is surprisingly simple. It's really a coming of age hero versus villain story. We are introduced to our hero in Luke Skywalker, who starts off as a farmer boy on a desert planet, who desperately wants to get off. As he gets to see a mysterious message from a princess in distress and meets an old man Obi-Wan Kenobi who is the last of the old Jedi Knights, his adventure begins. This is probably the only Star Wars movie that properly explains what the Force is. It surrounds us, it penetrates us, it binds the galaxy together. It also introduces you to the Jedi's iconic weapon of the lightsaber. Fast forward to the introduction of the badass Han Solo, played by Harrison Ford, alongside his tacky hairy alien friend Chewbacca, and you have the iconic cast of the original Star Wars, ready to help out the rebels overthrow the Empire led by Darth Vader. This movie also introduces us to the iconic Death Star that Luke needs to destroy. All in all, I think this movie has all the ingredients to make anyone who knows nothing about Star Wars at the very least familiar with everything they should know about. And also, I think, had Lucas only made this film, it would have probably held up too as a fun little sci-fi adventure. It's a pretty complete movie. The hero comes of age, fulfilling his destiny to take on an oppressing villain, he meets colorful allies and he eventually destroys the evil Death Star. The end. If I were to give this movie one piece of criticism, it's probably the way in which Luke masters the Force. It seems he masters it all a bit too quickly within the context of just this film. He starts off knowing absolutely nothing about the Force or Jedi Knights or anything and he ends up destroying a space weapon the size of the moon by the end of the film. Relatively easy too. The Death Star has a fatal flaw when you blast inside a certain hole, the whole thing explodes. 
Any attack made by the rebels against this station would be a useless gesture. No matter what technical data they've obtained, this station is now the ultimate power in the universe. That is fantastic. Terrific work. So no weaknesses at all, huh? No. No. You, uh, you hesitated there. Is there something I should know? No, it's virtually indestructible, like 99.99%. Uh, okay. Wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't ask what's the .01. Well, I, I mean, there's this little hole. It was kind of an aesthetic choice by the architect, and if you shoot a laser into this hole, uh, the station blows up. Whoa, 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 whoa. That sounds like a pretty big design flaw there. No, no, no. The hole's only two meters across. <sighs> All right, so we're going to plug up that hole? Yeah, we can get it done tomorrow if price is no object. Uh, we'll get estimates. Uh, get estimates, yeah. <laughs> it seems kind of far-fetched. Also, the way in which Luke is able to fly that X-Wing like it's nobody's business. How did he learn to do that? I mean, you could argue, yeah, well, he always wanted to become a pilot and stuff. And, you know, he flew around in that speeder on his planet. But if I always wanted to be a Formula One driver, that doesn't mean I'm able to become a world champion with just a week of playing Mario Kart. It seems too quickly. I know he does a little training under Obi-Wan in the ship, but that's apparently enough for him to destroy this freaking weapon of mass destruction. And I know they expand upon all of this much more within the other movies, but I'm saying just within this film, it seemed quick. Overall though, fantastic and timeless film that could stand very well on its own. But it didn't stand on its own, did it? I think The Empire Strikes Back is probably one of the best sequels in existence. Sure, people claim The Godfather Part 2 is one of the best sequels too. I always prefer the original myself. But Empire Strikes Back truly is an improvement and expansion to the already enjoyable original. I know it said Lucas planned all of the saga out and stuff beforehand. I don't know, it seems like here, with Empire Strikes Back, is when he truly started to deepen out things and really do the world building, forming the basis of what Star Wars would eventually become. Also, this is the film that introduced the dum 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 which totally should have been played in the previous movie when Darth Vader was introduced, by the way. My criticism of Luke's training seeming too fast in the original is dealt with much better in this film, with the introduction of Master Yoda. I really had very little to criticize with this movie because every scene was just enjoyable and immersive and I'm saying that as a totally casual fan of the series. I wish that iconic plot twist was remained unspoiled to me though. My girlfriend never saw any Star Wars movies before in her life, but even she knew that this was coming. It's just so well known. She was still surprised by Luke's hand being cut off though. Also, you gotta love the sequence with the giant elephant-like machines the Empire uses on the snow planet. Bond villain Julian Glover shows up in one of them, by the way. I know they're called the ad ads or the AT-ATs or whatever you want to call them. Super iconic. So is the Millennium Falcon, by the way, which I totally forgot to mention previously. This is also the movie that starts to develop the love between Leia and Han more. It's another dynamic of the story I really enjoy. Overall, this is probably the most flawless of the Star Wars films. Great movie. So, since we went in the machete order, this is where we made our flashback to the prequels. And like I said before, we did include episode 1. And I had a much better understanding of this film this time around, having now seen the first two of the original trilogy fresh in my mind. I still hold up this movie wouldn't be a great starting point for someone that never saw a Star Wars film though, because you wouldn't have a clue who Anakin will become. You're a lot more invested to know like, oh, so that's Obi-Wan Kenobi when he was young. Oh, so this is Darth Vader as a kid. They're called prequels for a reason. Still though, I thought the prequels had a lot of flaws. I do remember these films coming out, especially this one, and my VCR tapes would usually feature the trailer of this film at the start. But I don't hold any childhood nostalgia for these films or any Star Wars films for that matter. And I see them as a bit of an overload of CGI. 
missing that charming spark of the originals. That said, I do know this was made at the brink of the 21st century, so you should expect these movies to be different. I also felt that the story had a lot of flaws, or at least things that seemed super implausible to me. Like, the Jedi Knights come down to Anakin's planet and they need a part for their spaceship in order to get off that money can't buy. They need to win pot racing for this thing. Meanwhile, Anakin is a slave, yet he somehow has the resources to build a super advanced droid and a pot racer? Where does a slave get the resources? And more importantly, where does a slave get the time? So the Jedi can't even afford this one missing part and here's this enslaved 8 year old boy who's a technological genius and also an expert pod raiser. How does that make sense? And I was also left totally confused as to who Anakin's father is. His mother just mentions there was never a father. She just got pregnant. Like is Anakin like a Jedi Jesus? A prophecy? I never recall the original movies ever mentioning a chosen one of any kind. They do also mention the Metachlorians, but that's never really brought up again anymore either. I mean, again, I only know Star Wars on a shallow level, so what do I know? I did like the fight with Darth Maul at the end of the film though. That's the villain I remember on all the magazines when I was a kid. But then here in this fight, again, there was more stuff that just didn't make sense to me. Early on in the movie, the Jedi are suddenly able to have super speed in this film. I don't remember that from the originals either, but you know, here they can all of a sudden jump around like crazy and run like Roadrunner. But near the climax, as Liam Neeson is fighting Darth Maul, Obi-Wan takes a very, very long time to run towards them. And I'm thinking, what happened to your super speed now? Why not use it here while your friend clearly needs your help? It's really confusing. Also, Jar Jar Binks, super annoying. So this film to me was flawed, but okay. I understood it a lot better this time around than when I watched this one as my first, but it's just a bit phantom mehness to me. So we moved on to episode two, The Attack of the Clones. This one introduces us to grown up Anakin and not to pick on Hayden Christensen, but I felt his character of Anakin was just really spoiled and annoying. It's all Obi-Wan's fault. He's jealous. He's holding me back. He kind of reminds me of that raging internet kid, Steven from Waffle Pwn. Is this what you want? For me, I need my life. I'm sure Hayden Christensen is very beloved within Star Wars fandom and I do feel he did a great job in portraying a twisted character that inevitably turns evil. But I think Lucas's intention was to very gradually have him turn evil. But the transition from sweet little kid Anakin in the previous movie to spoiled brat in this one doesn't seem that gradual. He's already talking about how a dictatorship would be absolutely fine. He's already slaughtering women and children. He already seems like not the type of guy you would necessarily like to hang out with, let alone fall in love with. That's another thing I think I mostly remember from this film. Natalie Portman and Hayden Christensen falling in love. Which I feel felt kind of forced and not too believable. There was stuff I enjoyed in this one though, another Bond villain and Christopher Lee showing up, that's cool. And I guess Anakin losing his mother was a pretty emotional moment. I don't get why the Jedi never bothered to save her though. Aren't they supposed to be the guardians of peace and justice? She could have certainly used some justice. I know, you know, the whole tax problems and diplomacy shit was in the way in the previous film, but I thought most of that stuff was resolved. Now, it seemed to be more focused on separatists wanting to leave the Republic and the Jedi desperately wanting to keep them part of it, or else war could happen. That also, just as a newbie watcher, felt so convoluted and confusing compared to the original movies. Like, why start a war? These separatists just want to leave. Also, maybe Star Wars fans really like the fight between Christopher Lee and Master Yoda, but to me it felt so cartoony, like Yoda was some sort of Tasmanian devil. 
Maybe I'm old-fashioned. It's a decent Star Wars film, but not nearly as memorable as any of the originals, and it really felt like just a transition movie sandwiched in the middle of the prequels. Episode 3, on the other hand, easily was my favorite out of the prequels. All of a sudden, it got super dark. This one was unsettling and definitely moved something and got me thinking, which I applaud this movie for. I like the opening of this movie too. Sure, there is lots and lots of CGI, but it was pretty thrilling. Anakin cutting off Christopher Lee's head? That was dark too, damn. The temptation of Anakin slowly moving towards the dark side was very interesting. It seemed more gradual in this film. Obi-Wan gets to have some badass moments too, including a Bond-like one-liner. So uncivilized. And that eventual battle where Anakin comes in just when Samuel Jackson has the Sith Lord at his mercy, then Anakin cutting off his hands and the Emperor revealing himself, that's the moment you go, oh no, oh man, now everything's fucked. This was fatal. It's so unsettling and it's also super interesting to see Anakin didn't necessarily want to become pure evil. He just wanted to save his love and was kind of blackmailed and manipulated into it. Fully believing in the end that the Jedi were the bad guys. Well, in the middle of the movie, he still believes that the Jedi are selfless. Palpatine is a chilling villain you really start to hate and fear within this film because he's a master of manipulation. That ending fight between Obi-Wan and Anakin was pretty good and the part where he loses his legs and almost burns to death is super unsettling. Like, damn Obi-Wan, just relieve this guy out of his misery and kill him here. Don't let this guy burn to death in front of you, Jesus. The part where he slowly gets turned into Darth Vader, just as the mask is about to come on, you can very quietly make out that Anakin is saying, Help me, Padme. It's super subtle and, in my opinion, masterful filmmaking. Darth Vader is complex and seeing here how all the pieces fit together of how he became this villain which initially you would just see as the iconic badass pure evil mass dude now to someone who's in pain and was manipulated into becoming who he is. It offers a totally different perspective. The part where the Emperor tells him that Padme died and he's doing his no, you can see the sneaky smile. The Emperor clearly doesn't care about him. He just enjoys knowing he has full control over this powerful guy who's essentially imprisoned. It's super chilling. One thing I found hard to believe though, Anakin was allowed to cut off the head of his previous pupil. The Emperor clearly didn't care. What made him think he would be making a right choice trusting a guy like that? Overall, I do find it hard to believe that Lucas planned all of this stuff out beforehand. In the original Star Wars, when Obi-Wan and Darth Vader had their fight, it went like this. I've been waiting for you, Obi-Wan. We meet again at last. When I left you, I was but the learner. Now I am the master. That doesn't sound like a guy who lost his limbs, his wife, and burned his face to a guy he really hates. It sounds like, oh, these guys used to have a sportive sparring in the past, and then later, Anakin turned to evil. I do like what they did with it, though, in this film, but it doesn't seem like all of this was planned out beforehand. Also, if you're gonna watch in machete order as a first-time viewer, this will be the first reveal of Luke and Leia being twins. Which actually works very well too, I think. This was easily the best prequel film in my book. So going in the machete order and now understanding how Anakin became Darth Vader, we jump back to the big finale of the original trilogy. I do have to say, coming after that super dark film that was The Revenge of the Sith, you kind of have to get used to the tone of the opening here in Return of the Jedi. It felt very comedic and long, especially in contrast to that war opening of episode 3. This was a bit too much puppets and cartoony silliness for me coming after that film. That being said, I do think the film really steps up from there, building to a satisfying conclusion. The death of Master Yoda, the reveal to Luke that Leia is in fact his sister, 
Although in release order this would have been the original moment a first time viewer would find out about that, I still stand that seeing how they were born in episode 3, so fresh in your mind, it really helps a first time viewer. My girlfriend was really invested into the series by this point. Also, because of the machete order, I experienced more empathy for Darth Vader, now knowing about his background. And also, more doubt is raised whether or not Luke would turn to the dark side, having just witnessed how the Emperor manipulated Anakin the film before. Also, having more background on the Twisted Emperor having just come off the prequels, Darth Vader throwing him down, Darth Vader throwing him down to his grave is all the more satisfying. The redemption of Darth Vader, putting off his mask, revealing to Luke he was in fact right about him. It's a very memorable moment and a fitting ending to a deeply complex and iconic character. The Return of the Jedi to me is a satisfying ending to the original trilogy. Then Disney of course came along and released the sequel trilogy and we made a jump to the modern day sequel trilogy straight away. From what I understand, these sequels often get a bad rap, much like the prequels. It seems Star Wars fans have quite a consensus that the original trilogy is simply the best. But just watching these films casually, I have to say, I did enjoy The Force Awakens a lot too. I think it did well in both bringing in fresh new ideas, as well as remaining true to the spirit of the original series. I give them huge props for bringing back Harrison Ford, Carrie Fisher and even Mark Hamill. Even Star Wars fans got to appreciate that one, right? At the same time, I do think they brought forward a new interesting cast of characters. Rey is a likeable and mysterious new heroine, Poe is a badass and very likeable, and the idea of a former stormtrooper escaping the Empire, or the First Order as they are now called, is also quite an interesting concept. I really liked it. As a Star Wars newbie, I did go, oh wait, weren't the stormtroopers introduced to be clones when they were made in episode 2? And then I soon realized, oh, oh no, wait, they, those were the first batch of stormtroopers. Got it. Speaking of stormtroopers, as a Bond fan, you gotta appreciate Daniel Craig's obvious cameo in this film. What did you say? You will remove these restraints and leave this cell with the door open. I will remove these restraints and leave the cell with the door open. And you'll drop your weapon? And I'll drop my weapon. I mean, even without just his voice, you can totally recognize his signature walk as well. I think what this movie also delivered on was a lot of the humor. This film was funny and really leans much more towards the positive than the negative for me. Kylo Ren is also such a compelling new villain, surprisingly introduced as Solo's and Leia's son turned over to the dark side. Him killing his own father was both brutal and heartbreaking, a very moving moment, even to me as just a casual fan. I do also think this film did a lot of fan service, with the return of the Millennium Falcon and the previously mentioned original cast. They also introduced a new weapon very similar to the Death Star, only a lot bigger. So in a way, this film kind of resembled the original Star Wars, but with a totally different characters and motives and it still made it feel fresh and not just a copy of the original. I do have to say, I do have similar critiques here as I did to A New Hope. How did Rey master everything so damn quickly? Much like Luke, one day she's a nobody on a sand planet, next day she's flying spaceships through impossible situations and is fighting one of the most powerful beams in the galaxy. I mean, it's Star Wars and it's fun, I don't mind, but it doesn't make sense. That being said though, with Rey, it's not supposed to make sense because she even addresses that she has no idea how she's able to do all of this within the context of the film. This is supposed to be the mystery surrounding her character and I'm fully expecting that this is going to be explored more in episode 8 and 9. This is why for me the character of Rey being, you know, kind of a Mary Sue isn't that much of a problem, at least not for me. 
They definitely know how to whet your appetite with these new sequels. Like who are Rey's parents? Will Kylo Ren ever redeem himself? And most of all, where the hell did this giant dude come from? Having never watched episode 8 and 9 before, I was totally ready to see these questions be answered. I heard and read about a lot of negativity surrounding The Last Jedi before watching this and was fully ready to see a go woke go broke type of film. And I gotta say, it wasn't as bad as I envisioned. I didn't know what to expect, but I did enjoy most of it. I can understand if you are a long term fan of Star Wars, like for years, that moment of Luke just walking away and throwing out his lightsaber, preferring to hide instead of fight, it's much more a moment of protest as it is to me as a casual newbie just watching all of these films within a few days. I thought the idea of a space like Monte Carlo was kind of different and seeing another Bond actor in Benicio Del Toro turn up in this film, that was a surprise to me. But there were also definitely some major what the fuck moments in there for me too. Leia floating back to the ship in space was one of the okay yeah right moments for me. Also big scary dude turned out to be little scary dude in this film and was killed off. I was really expecting this Snoke guy to have much more of a character arc and a big build up revealed to be the big badass villain behind it though. But no, he was just tossed aside. Okay then. It still wasn't explained where the hell he came from though. A lot was once again left in mystery which I guess is also good. Not everything needs to be spoon fed to you immediately which I guess is an appeal to Star Wars movies. They leave you wondering and guessing. And still surprise and trick you too. They certainly did that with me with the climax of Luke Skywalker confronting the First Order army and taking on all the cannons and just casually dusting himself off. Now I'm sure Star Wars fans immediately went oh he's not really there he's just using the force. I wasn't that fast I just went how the hell did he do that? Then when it's revealed that it was all a decoy and a big F you to Kylo Ren really well done. I believe Mark Hamill himself wasn't too pleased where the director took his character with these sequels, but I feel he absolutely nailed it in this film. So overall I think had I been more invested in Star Wars for years like I am with Bond, I probably have a much more outspoken and maybe even offended opinion about a lot of this stuff. A purple haired general, an out of character Luke Skywalker, Leia magically floating back to the ship. But seeing as I don't feel to be in a position to be that much of an outspoken fan about it as a newbie, I enjoyed this film for what it is and to me it's a surprisingly well made film that left me hungry for the final film and kept me wondering. Mostly on the same questions, who are Rey's parents, is Kylo Ren ever going to redeem himself and where the hell did big dude that turned out to be small dude come from? So we ended up watching episode 9 straight after episode 8. Now as a newbie I didn't get to be part of the two years of speculating and really thinking out all of the possibilities of what was to come here, I just booted up the next film. So immediately reading in the opening crawl about the return of Palpatine blew my mind. Oh man that bastard's back? How on earth did he survive that? So much for Darth Vader redeeming himself. But then I immediately realized that Palpatine did mention the secrets of cheating dad all the way back in the prequels. I found myself immediately speculating as I was watching this movie. Will Luke turn out to be the father of Rey after all or will perhaps Palpatine be the father? Then after she did that lightning attack where she totally made us believe that Chewie was killed by the way, I still don't get that one. Like how did we miss that second ship? Anyway, so after she did that lightning attack it was obvious she was the daughter or granddaughter or great granddaughter of the Emperor himself. I was immediately thinking. Wait, it's probably going to be explained how Palpatine can magically impregnate women. You know, non-sexually. Through that Metaglorian stuff that they talked about all the way back in episode 1. Just like how Anakin was conceived. So maybe in secret Palpatine had planned Anakin's birth all along, preparing them for the dark side and now he did the same thing with Rey. It's all going to come full circle here. 
Of course I was completely wrong about that. She just somehow is his granddaughter. I don't even know. Fine. I did think the movie was fun, don't get me wrong. I did like Ray's battle with Kylo Ren and the moment of him finally redeeming himself. Harrison Ford made another surprise cameo, that was pretty cool. Half of the galaxy showing up to help the rebels in the ending was pretty epic too. That was a great climax. The showdown with Palpatine was pretty good too, but also confusing. I still don't understand why exactly Kylo Ren and Rey were so bonded within the Force. I know Palpatine explains that a Force Diad wasn't seen for, what did he say, like thousands of years. And I know Kylo's grandfather was Vader and... Ray's grandfather was the Emperor, but how does that explain the special bond? And then they kiss out of left field. That was kinda weird. I never picked up on any romantic feelings between these two. Their bond always seemed more of a brother and sister type of relationship, or maybe like cousins or something, but apparently they fell in love now. In The Force Awakens, I was convinced she was going to end up with Finn. And speaking of Finn, Coming after episode 8, you totally expect him to end up with that Asian chick after that kiss in the previous film. But no, now they brought in this other black girl who also happened to formerly be a stormtrooper. And somehow is implied to be the daughter of Lando or something? Or maybe that wasn't implied, but that's what I kind of got from that. It's super weird. So... Overall, I describe the sequel trilogy as super entertaining, a nice watch, but very confusing and convoluted, leaving you with a lot of questions. They kind of struggled with the same type of problems that the modern day Bond films struggled with. They try to come up with one continuity, but seem to just make it up as they go. So, that was my quick journey as a newbie visiting the Star Wars movies. As someone who wasn't previously too familiar with this franchise, I can totally understand why fans fall in love with it. It's a lot of fun and these past days, the film certainly put my mind to work trying to connect the dots as I was getting more and more invested into them. Episode 3 in particular really got me thinking, what a dark film that was. I had to rewatch the ending a couple of times just because of how epic that whole thing was set up. Episode 5 probably still is my favorite if I had to name one. That one just feels like the essence of what Star Wars is about. And now that I named the best of those trilogies, out of the sequel trilogy, I think I like The Force Awakens the best. I still have a ton of newbie Star Wars questions though, like why did the lightning attack disfigure Palpatine in Episode 3 but it didn't scar Luke in Episode 6? Or was the disfiguring of his face actually the true appearance of Palpatine all along? That also really doesn't make sense, because if that was the case, why would he tell the Senate that he got disfigured? He could have just changed back to the fake appearance if all of that was the case. Also, why do the bodies of Obi-Wan and Yoda and Luke and Ben Solo all disappear when they died? Is that a Jedi thing? If so, then why didn't the bodies of Darth Vader and Qui-Gon Jinn disappear? They needed to be burned. And lastly, who was the kid at the end of episode 8? Did he have any significance in the story or maybe in one of the side movies or something? That left me confused too. I'm sure I have to revisit these movies more often to find much more of the stuff I missed having only invested myself into them properly recently. But it was a lot of fun to do. I know there is a shit ton of other side movies to check out now and the Obi-Wan Disney Plus series. There's the Lego Star Wars, there is the 3D animated Star Wars movies and God knows what else. But to this video, I just shared my opinion on the Skywalker Saga. I hope you enjoyed. Please like and subscribe if you did. Let me know if you're a Star Wars fan yourself and what your opinion is on the series. And I see you guys in the next video.